What's up, everybody? It's Alex from Heavy New York. We are back at the St. Vitus basement for the Bloodletting North American tour, and we are here with Steve of Visceral Discourse. Thank you for your time today, man. Hey, no problem, man. How you doing? Doing great. Okay. Your latest record is Slithering Evisceration. Yeah. Um, do you just want to talk about how the making of this record was, the recording and all that fun um, stuff? Uh, it was made pretty quickly. Um, we had a lot of ideas, uh, scattered about ideas, and... Um, we were able to work together and put all these ideas together in kind of a blender and um, it came out pretty good um, Yeah, the recording process didn't take too long at all because we were we were on our game um, Yeah, we didn't use uh, Any kind of like not no fake drums anything like that. It, it, it was all Billy so um, as hard as it is to believe yeah, that's all Billy <laughs> damn Yeah, was there a preconceived idea going into making this record or was a lot of the stuff like improvised and kind of fell into place organically? Um, it just kind of fell into place um, we're, we're all good songwriters, I think um, so um, we just had to feed off each other and um, it was more like um, oh yeah, that's cool. Yeah, that's cool. Kind of thing. Then you know, like one particular person going, "Oh, I have this idea. I have this idea." You know, it was just kind of a collaborative effort, um, which was really, really cool. It was really cool to work with these dudes. Interesting. When it comes to playing your material live, do you try to execute it exactly how people are going to hear it on the album? Because when I saw oh, you on that, okay. Because when of I saw course. you at that suffocation uh, tour at Gramercy uh, last year, that was a quite different experience. It sounded great, but like, uh, yeah, well. Um, we do play a little faster live, yeah. um, especially the older material. Um, this Billy, I guess, has a ten he likes to go fast. Yeah, <laughs> which go I don't. Fast. I don't blame him. I don't blame him, man. He's good at it. Um, but yeah, yeah. The the first album was recorded, you know, very like mid mid tempo, mid pace, you know, kind of like one twenty, you know, BPM, you know, two hundred BPM kind of stuff. Whereas Billy's, um, his probably. His probably home speed, where he's comfortable at, is probably about 250 or so. Um, that's usually where his comfort zone. So uh, we wrote stuff when we were writing this album. We wrote stuff for his comfort zone, pretty much, um, which is where the speed of it came from. Interesting. So do you take a new approach to every single album that you make, or do you have like a formula that you tend to like to stick with? Nah, I'm old school. Um, I. I'm of the mindset that every album should be different. Mm -hmm. um, I don't want to make the same album over and over again. It's just, it could get boring. I, I, uh, I grew up in the old school death metal where every album sounded different, you know, whether, it, no matter what band it was, it was always doing different. Death is a prime example of that. Every album kind of sounded different. You yeah. can even go with the Cannibal Corpse. Every album sounded different from one to the next, you know, and, um, yeah, I always liked that because it was like, oh, it was always a surprise. Like, what are you going to do next kind of thing? And, um, yeah, uh, that's what I like doing. You really feel like a lot of those Cannibal Corpse albums sounds different? I don't know. Like, I The earlier stuff definitely does, man. Um, um, like, if you listen from, like, uh, like Tomb of the Mutilated to the Bleeding, that's a big change. To um, an extent. Yeah, and from the Bleeding to Vile, that's a big change. Um, you know, of course, they got a new vocalist then, but even musically, that's a big change. Yeah. I was kind of a poser when I first discovered them. Like, the first song I had was Stripped, Rape, and Strangled, and then okay. Make Them Suffer. So I had a Corpse okay. Grinder era and a Chris Barnes okay. era, and I okay. actually didn't know the difference until I was, like, reading about them and all that. <laughs> so maybe you were just more in-depth than I was. Yeah, well, I grew up in uh, kind of that era, you know, um, where it was just starting to... Uh, come up from the underground a little bit and actually was being played on like MTV and radio stations and stuff like that like you would hear Morbid Angel and um, you know MTV would play Slayer videos during the day and stuff like that and yeah imagine that they play videos you know wow imagine that concept damn <laughs> and you couldn't steal them either yeah yeah right <laughs> there you go now one thing i'm uh, actually really curious about being a guitar player like do you um have to like I is it easier to write music when you're with the entirety of your band or do you do ideas come a little bit easier when you're kind of like alone and more isolated um both um it's always good to um get other opinions you know like some a lot of times you know i'll just riff around at home and be like oh that's that sounds kind of cool and then i'll 
go to a rehearsal space and go, okay, what do you guys think of this? And we'll collaborate on it, you know. Um, if they like, sometimes they'll like it and be like, oh, yeah, that's awesome. And sometimes we'll be like, well, maybe if we added this and added this and kind of collaborated on things. Um, yeah, that's kind of how stuff comes about. Um, I always feel that the, um, the most creative things are done um, in a group. Um, ideas bouncing back and forth and um, that's where I think the most creative stuff comes from um, normally mm -hmm. normally do, is there a theoretical element behind your guitar do you follow like if like you're soloing you're working off of a specific scale mode or do you follow like a certain chord progression it's or just feeling yeah uh, it's just it's just more heart and soul you know um, got to feel it um, yeah I just play how I feel okay so it's not like there's like you, you kind of answered it before but a lot of improvising involved you don't really like um sometimes we'll come up with riffs like that like we'll be um you know just kind of practicing and just kind of freestyle and, and sometimes we'll come up with a, a cool riff that's like oh man that sounds really cool maybe we can hear a cool slam that's like oh man that sounds really cool maybe we can use that somewhere and maybe build around it or throw it in a song or something that's already being worked on mm -hmm. um but uh, it's kind of 50-50, I guess. You know, some of it's like us sitting at home and going, okay, these are cool riffs. And some of it is us just jamming in the room. There you go. Yeah. And I have uh, two more questions for you. We'll, sure. get, we'll get the hardest question out of the way. Uh-oh, uh-oh. Yeah. <laughs> How do you know when a song is done? Um, I don't know. I mean, a song really, you could write a song forever. Yeah. You know, um, especially if you're a doom metal band with like a 27 and a half minute. <laughs> right. You know, My Dying Bride will play like three songs a, a show. Um, 40 minutes late to a Dream Theater show made it before they got to the first chorus. <laughs> right. Um, I don't know. Um, I guess it just depends on the songs. Sometimes songs kind of write themselves. Um, you just got to hear it and listen to it and figure out where it's going to go. Um, yeah, it just depends on the on the song. Um, you know, I like to end with a good slam riff. You know, sometimes, uh, actually, a lot of the times. Um, but you know, occasionally, a good like techy noodley riff is good to end the material. You know, good stops or something. Um, yeah, it just depends on how we're feeling uh, at that point in time. Sometimes we'll end the song and be like, okay, that's it. And then we'll go back to it, um, you know, uh, after playing it a little bit and going, you know what, it needs a little bit more. Um, let's try to put this and this and this to it, you know, see what happens and kind of go from there. But yeah, that's pretty much, um, yeah, it's not really a set like, oh, we got to stop here or we're, we're looking for this, like, oh, it's got to be three minutes or three minutes, 25 seconds on a dot. Yeah. You know, no, nah, no, nah, it just kind of ends where it ends. There you go. Sometimes it helps if you have a deadline, too. Uh, sometimes, sometimes. But, you know, we don't really focus on, we focus more on the song itself rather than like, oh, it's this, this, this time, it's this much time. We need to add some more. We need to take, it's too long. We need to take some off of it, you know. Yeah. We don't really do that. There you go. And uh, the final question I want to ask you is coming from Baltimore, Maryland. You know, I mean, it's the home of dying fetus, which I feel like is like the, there. That's like the way Cannibal Corpse is to Buffalo or the way Morbid Angel is to Florida. Like, yeah. I feel like you guys are like, or uh, dying fetus and you guys too are kind of like that sort of movement in Maryland. Is yeah. there like a scene in Baltimore that you guys are kind of affiliated with? Or did you prefer to go outside your hometown a little bit more? To well, you always want to go outside your hometown. You don't want to play yourself out in your hometown man um but there's guys uh we all practice in the same studio in the same uh, rehearsal space so dying fetus is like pretty much next door to us mm -hmm. um and we're all friends and you know when they're there when we're when we're, the two of us are there we're kind of in and out of each other's rooms we talk and, um but yeah man um there is a good scene in baltimore though it's very under it's a very underground mentality scene in, in the baltimore area and i love it man i love it um, I grew up playing shows in that scene um, from the time I was like 16 to now. You know, I think we're going to be back at least close to Baltimore in the next couple of days, 6-11. Um, um, but not quite in the city. It's like north of the city. Okay. But I love, I love the scene in Baltimore, man. We get so much support, and it's a lot of love, man. It's a lot of love. It's a big family, man. It's like, yeah. you know, all everywhere, you know, just all of the whole metal scene. It's just a brotherhood. It's a big family, man. It's awesome. It's awesome. Any bands from there you want to shout out in, like, the underground? or? Oh, of, of course, Fetus, uh, Bound by the Grave. Awesome dudes. Very, very cool guys. Um, friends for a while. Uh, old school friends. Um, 
Oh, man, you're putting me on the spot, man. See, <laughs> see, we're going to get off here, and I'm going to think of, like, 20 man rushes. <laughs> you know, it's going to be like, oh, uh, yeah, this guy, these guys, these guys. These I got guys, you on the but, spot. Yeah, yeah, you got me on the spot now. And I'm like, oh, what's a band? What's a band? Yeah. Shit. Uh, that's okay. That's okay. Yeah. Forgive me, please. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> well, so before we go, I want to thank you so much for your time today. No problem, brother. No problem. Yeah. It was nice meeting you. Yeah. So just anything else uh, uh, that you want to promote for the Slithering Evisceration record cycle? Yeah, man. Um, if you don't have it, pick it up. Um, be prepared to shit your pants. <laughs> um, yeah, come see us uh, on tour, Bloodletting Tour 2019. Um, we'll be going down the East Coast and then heading west. Um, tour ends in San Diego, so catch us before then. But you know, we'll be doing other runs after this, so um, you have plenty of chance to see us live. So come check us out. Come bang your head and stomp around with us. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. Thank you, my brother. Everybody, Steve of Visceral Discord, Slithering Evisceration. Pick that up if you haven't already. This is Alex from Heavy New York, Bloodletting Tour North America. We'll see you next time.